in 2016. Prior to that, Sean completed his bachelor's in, in applied science and justice studies at the University of Guelph Humber and is currently working on a number of portfolios including unclaimed bodies, high profile case analytics, schools of anatomy liaison, and leads and leads the By What Means Committee. Sean has experience with TD Bank Securities and is currently the treasurer for the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services United Way campaign. And from St. Mike's, we have Mike. Mike. Michael Cotto, many of you know, he's been a patient transport assistant here since 2012 and transitioned into having part-time morgue duties, morgue attendant duties in 2014. Mike recently won a St. Michael's Values in Action Award for his commitment to improving the experiences of patients and families of our deceased patients. And my name is Marissa Cicero. I've been a social worker for 20 years, practicing in a wide variety of areas, including maternal and fetal medicine, where I led work around perinatal loss and grief. In my current role as Director of Health Disciplines, I'm responsible for the practice and education support for our 30 health discipline groups here at St. Mike's. And I fell down the rabbit hole of this area of practice almost a year ago when a clinician gave us some feedback about her experience supporting a woman coming to see her recently deceased husband in our morgue, and it was less than ideal. Since then, with the help of a fantastic team, I've been privileged to lead hospital-wide work in and around our care after death processes, ensuring that they reflect best practices and crucially are patient and family focused. And that's one of the main things we wanna talk about today. So our objectives, they were published. It's effectively to understand a bit about the legislative and policy landscape related to unclaimed bodies and conducting reasonable searches, which is something that those of us from healthcare organizations are becoming increasingly familiar with, and the issuing of warrants to bury at the expense of municipalities. Um, hopefully we'll be able to appreciate the need for robust processes to advance the patient and family experience in the work that we do after death and learn how to facilitate organizational processes that support timely and dignified burials. And that's really where this joint presentation comes from is it, it was through our work at St. Mike's in realizing that we had, we had areas for improvement in this area of practice and reaching out and, and fostering a, what turned out to be a great relationship with the coroner's office. So we're hoping um, we can save some organizations some growing pains that, that we had. So why now? This isn't new. There's been unclaimed bodies for as long as the, you'll get some more information about how many and, and where from, but certainly people dying isn't new, unclaimed bodies aren't new. Um, but we really at St. Mike's, the drive for this was we had a bit of perfect, we had a bit of a perfect storm. Um, that's my Dorothy um, tribute. A bit of a perfect storm in terms of why this came up for us. And I think many of those issues are shared across organizations across the province. So staffing demands, we went, a lot of organizations don't have full-time work attendance anymore. And that's in hospitals. If you're at a long-term care center, you don't even have morgues in 99% of the cases. Forget morgue attendants. Um, morgue capacity. So whether you have a morgue or not, there's there's if there's a finite amount of space at St. Mike's. We have quite a small morgue, um, considering our, our number of beds and the percentage and the people that we get that we struggle to move on because they're unclaimed. Um, budget pressures. There are great options that exist for both long-term care facilities and hospitals in employing off-site storage contracts, but there's a financial implication there that isn't easy for any of us to, um, to shoulder at the moment. Um, and those budget pressure pressures extend not just for us, but also for the coroner's office, and you'll hear a bit more about that. Um, so maybe cases where they were able to offer us a bit of a storage while we figured out who was coming for whom. Those, real, those opportunities are fewer and far between, if available at all. So all of this led us to look at what we're doing um, and how we're doing it. So Sean's up next. Hello everyone, I'll, be, I'll just be talking about the uh, 2015 and 2016 numbers of unclean bodies that we've had in Ontario. Um, so as you can see, we are facing an increase, and um, I can't really speak to direct, uh, the direct cause of that, especially looking at numbers in 2008, 2009, and 2014 to 2015. However, I can just talk about the similar dynamics in each of the cases that I've looked at. Um, 
In some cases, we've seen the uh, decedents have a history of substance abuse, uh, dysfunctional or estranged family, and just the financial burdens of the surviving next of kin. Um, and we can also see how three of those factors could intertwine in a uh, family dynamic. Um, and we're increasingly seeing the uh, documentation barriers with social services. So a family member, for example, is looking to claim, however, they face challenges of uh, receiving a SIN number, a death, uh, sorry, birth certificate, and a tax form assessment, and they just don't have that information. Um, and we um, also keep in mind that this trend is not exclusive to Ontario. We have provinces like Quebec, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan that are also facing the uh, similar challenges that we're facing. And just looking at the uh, suspecting numbers in 2017, uh, we're looking at about 400 or so bodies. So it doesn't seem like this is uh, this issue is solving anytime soon. And um, here we're just looking at the unclaimed landscape in Ontario. So same numbers, 2015 to 2016. Um, we can see that a bulk of the uh, cases are in Toronto. However, that's not to ignore um, the unclaimed bodies that are coming out of Hamilton, Kingston, London, uh, Ottawa. Um, there's also an increase in, in that as well. And also interesting to look at the regional nuances. Um, some pockets or areas in the north um, are also facing the opposite issue where they're, they're having more than one person or organization actually looking to claim uh, the body, um, especially if they're from a, a band or uh, indigenous uh, organization. So that's also important to speak about because the areas that do uh, receive infrequent unclaimed bodies, it's great to have this type of discussion so that if they do or when they do have an unclaimed body, the process is as seamless as possible. And we're just going to look at the age um, distribution of unclaimed bodies um, in 2015 and 16. So I just wanted to point out that the undetermined uh, section or, or category on the left is defined as an unclaimed, unidentified coroner's case where the diagnostic imaging has been completed. So the CT, the MRI scans have been completed. Um, the DNA samples were taken. And at that point, we're just looking to have a timely, proper and dignified um, disposition of the unclaimed body as opposed to uh, having it just remain at the morgue. And um, also, if you just look to the to the right, um, we can see that the stillborn and live birth and uh, three month year old um, cases are also involved. So it's, it's not just exclusive to um, the older older folks, it's, it's also prevalent there. And also one of the biggest jumps that, that we see here is uh, within the ages of 60 to 80 uh, years old. And once again, I, I can't find the exact reasoning behind this, but some of the similarities and trends of these uh, individuals is that um, if they, um, they have individuals and their parents who have died already, and if they do have family, uh, it's been estranged. And once they find out that their loved one has, has died, it doesn't seem like they're interested in, in claiming. Ready? And I'll just pass it to Deidre. I'm Deidre Bainbridge, and I'm just going to queue up a video that uh, CBC did. No, sorry, Global did in um, the beginning, the end of last year. For many, the thought of dying is scary, but what about the thought of dying alone? The truth is, it's becoming more of a reality for people in Canada's most populous provinces. Data obtained by Global News shows that in Ontario and Quebec, an increasing number of bodies remain unclaimed. What this means is that nobody, not even a single soul, was able to gather the remains for a funeral. In 2006, the number of unclaimed bodies in Ontario was 146. Almost 10 years later, that number more than doubled to 361 in 2015. Quebec shows a similar trend, with the number of unclaimed bodies increasing from 190 in 2007 to 367 in 2015. 
society's like an apartment building. Everybody's got their little cubicle and they just go to work or do their thing during the day and then lock themselves away. Empty, silent, and somber, funeral ceremonies are run by people like Witzel, who are paid by the city and the province for their services. The city where the person died is responsible for burying the body. They find a local funeral home willing to take care of the ceremony. Nobody comes. Nobody comes except those of us who are paid to be here. For Global News, I'm Emanuela Campanella. What gives you a sense of um, Close this window so we don't get the next video of penguins or such. Thank you, Sean. Okay. So moving on, um, we're going to look at a little bit of legislative framework that tells us about uh, who uh, controls uh, an unclaimed body and what some of the powers of the coroner's offices and our obligations of um, agencies that we're working with related to this legislation. And so section three of the coroner's act is really what applies. And that is the person having possession of the body of a deceased person that is unclaimed within 24 hours after the death shall um, so there is shall and may. Shall compels that person. May gives us an option. So shall lo notify the local inspector. The general inspector is Dirk Heyer, the chief coroner of Ontario. The local inspector are the uh, coroners, regional supervising coroners. And shall furnish this local inspector with such information respecting the diseased person as is within the knowledge of the notifier and as the local inspector may require. And this is the basis upon which uh, we issued a memo um, to hospitals in March of this year and then to long-term care facilities in June of this year um, asking uh, that they work their unclaimed cases. Uh, with respect to long-term care facilities, uh, we're hoping that they're able to get more ahead of the issue because they'll be able to identify those folks who are at risk of being unclaimed when they are admitted, knowing that this is very likely to be this person's uh, last stop in terms of a residence, so that when they do pass, it doesn't become a, a, an emergency and it's not so difficult to uh, locate or to actually determine that this is going to be an unclaimed person. Now, if the unclaimed body falls under the jurisdiction of a coroner and coroners uh, take cases that are criminally suspicious, uh, possibly uh, so, uh, suicide, um, and accidental. What does not fall within our jurisdiction or our work would be a natural death. So a palliative patient who decides that they would prefer to die at home uh, or someone who dies in hospital of a medical issue that isn't related to any kind of an accident such as a fall and a hip fracture. Um, those are cases that are not taken by our office. Uh, and so we are asking that the hospitals where those patients pass away and long-term care facilities where some people pass away from a natural to causes, they are having to make their own arrangements with regards to storing the body and making their own arrangements with regards to um, working a next of kin search and conducting a reasonable next of kin search. This is another reason why, or one of the other drivers, not so long ago in 2010, there was a very high profile media case where a man of no fixed address passed away. And probably because he was of no fixed address, it was assumed that he would be unclaimed. 
this man actually had family that he was in touch with on a weekly basis. In this case, his clothing was not searched. If it was searched, they would have found a wallet that contained the contact information for his family. And because that didn't happen, he was assumed to be unclaimed and he was buried by the city uh, at, the, um, at the requirement of the coroner's office. Two weeks later, his family went looking for him. They hadn't heard from him and they were shocked and, and quite appalled to find that he was buried by the city, that they weren't notified. And this family, uh, one of his sons was a police officer. They eventually launched a civil suit against the police division and the police officers who did not search the clothing, which is something that they're required to do, as well as the coroner's office that was involved. Um, so this can have big uh, expenses if a uh, suit is filed. And if the family ends up wanting to exhume the body, that can be a very emotional as well as an expensive process. And we want to avoid that. So we certainly want to avoid a case where we bury someone who, who, shouldn't, who should be buried by their family. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, we're going to dig in a bit now to what exactly a reasonable search is. So Clint Eastwood, his charms would be impervious to the coroner's office um, because they really, um, Deidre alluded to the, to the powers that the coroner has, and you'll hear more about those in a bit. But the first one is really they can dictate, and they have dictated to us as healthcare organizations, that we really have to do a good job of this reasonable search. So the very first time that they wrote to us about it was actually back in 2010 when they communicated to the OMA that they would no longer be storing unclaimed bodies and doing that work, that that was going to be downshifted, if that's the right word, to hospital organizations. We heard about it again, as Deidre said, um, in a letter to the OHA in 2017 that covered hospitals, and then slightly longer after that, sorry, in June, to long-term care homes. So it's, it's again back to that slide where it's not particularly new, but given some of the constellation of other things that are happening, it's been impactful. So reasonable searches aren't defined, which is something that you know, makes it even makes it a bit a bit harder. So as as Deidre said, we have an obligation to conduct a reasonable search for a claimant before the coroner's office will take responsibility for the body and only when the healthcare organization is unable to identify identify or locate a next of kin despite our best efforts, or we find next of kin and they tell us that they're not willing to claim. So although it's not defined, we do have a couple of parameters that we're working with when we talk about reasonable searches. And the first that it's not is that it's not exhaustive. So it's, it's that, can, that, that gauge down there where we can't be negligent like they were in the Thompson case and not look through pockets and not look at our electronic health records to see if we have next of kin or emergency contact for someone. But we're not expecting Mike or staff at other healthcare organizations to, you know, drive to someone's house and knock on a door and find out why they're not responding to the registered letter that we sent them. Um, but I have to say that that's a process that you'll see Mike's going to talk you through a bit in a bit more detail how we translated a reasonable search here at St. Mike's, but there is some subjectivity involved in it and that's what um, makes it difficult, but also um, leads to lots of interesting conversations with our coroner's office colleagues. Um, and a standardized protocol for claimant searches does set the bar for reasonable and reasonability and consistency. So this is the same thing when we're talking about documentation. If you always document in the same way and you forget to do it one time and you're called up on that, you can say, hey, but look at all my other documentation. It, it says that I've always asked for consent and explain the limits of confidentiality with my practice hat on. Um, it's the same thing for reasonable searches. So if you do the same thing in the same, in a standardized way, it's going to help set the expectation that your, your organization is committed to not being on the negligent end of the spectrum. But what this means and where this kind of came to a tipping point for us not too long ago is that for many organizations, while you're doing the reasonable search, it means that the body stays with you. 
And for those of us without morgues or with morgues that are, are less than ideal, and we saw that number in Toronto, we have, we have quite a few that have unclaimed people that come through, certainly our doors at St. Mike's, um, it's, it's something that, that we have to manage as an organization and, and figure out how to, how to best support. Deidre is going to take through, you through some of those more powerful functions. Marissa said about not being exhaustive and being reasonable. Essentially, we're trying to balance out a timely disposition for the body uh, with being efforts into a next of kin search. So we don't want folks to remain in morgues for months. Um, and we also want to be sure that we have followed up to the best of our ability on any loose threads related to next of kin. So oh, police can be very helpful in that. And police uh, have access to things, uh, databases that we may not have access to. Uh, and that can be particularly useful in situations where I have, may have talked to a housing worker and they say, you know, I, he has an ex-wife and I think a daughter. And then the nurse at the hospice who said he has a picture in his wallet of three kids but we actually don't know the names of any of these people. We don't know the location of any of these people. And so because there is at least the hint that there may be some next of kin and we have no uh, thread to pick up, uh, the police can be helpful with that. Um, now the police uh, in the legislation um, also need to help out the coroner's office when we ask. Um, so that we can call them and ask them to conduct a next of kin or claimant search on a particular decedent and they will do that for us. This sometimes though is where facilities uh, with non-coroner cases uh, run into a bit of trouble. In our guidelines we, we want the police to be called for every case um, but a lot of times the experience of a civil servant who is calling the police for a natural death will get the response that this is a non-criminal matter and so it's not a police matter. Um, and so we are trying to work with different police divisions, but as you can imagine, there are lots in Ontario. Um, and what I would encourage is that when you're talking with an officer, you can say that you're acting essentially as proxy for the coroner's office. If you call and they give you no information, we'll call and have, and have to get information. So it, it just ends up being a, re, a repeat um, and more work for us. The police end up still having to do the same work. We also have a, a piece as part of the next of kin search that involves the Ontario public guardian and trustee. Uh, if at the end of our search of um, people's names, numbers on files, and after talking with police, we have nothing. We will then uh, launch an estate inquiry with the uh, Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. And that email address that you see on the slides is a little bit of an error in it. It's actually OPGT estates admin at Ontario.ca. And I usually work with them by email um, because I'll have a reply in writing as to whether or not they qualify. Essentially, OPGT looks at the estate, looks at the assets, and at the debts. If at the end of that, the decedent has more than $10,000, OPGT will then claim the estate and administer funds to bury the decedent. As part of their search, they may come up with more next of kin. If it, their estate is less than $10,000, they will not qualify for OPGT representation. And if they have next of kin in Ontario, whether or not that next of kin wants to claim the body or not, OPGT will not investigate at all. So if they have funds less than 10,000, still, yeah, still good information because ultimately after OPGT, the case comes to the coroner's office and then we will declare the body unclaimed. We will claim the body and we will issue a warrant to the municipality to bury the body. 
And if we know that there is some money in the estate, we can uh, let social services know so that they can recoup some of those or all of those expenses. When launching an inquiry, if it's accepted by OPGT and you get an email within 24 to 48 hours, uh, it can and usually does take 30 days uh, for them to do their search. They send letters to all of the banks and then they need to wait to get that information back. And so that is fast with OPGT. I have had about three cases that have taken eight weeks or so. Um, that's usually where there is uh, an estate over $10,000, um, but a one month is actually pretty quick. So the sooner this is launched, the better in terms of morgue capacity and other issues that can affect the body with time. There's also an important distinction to be made. OPGT has local representatives for financial and care and treatment decisions, and then the estates division. So the estates division is what I was just referring to in terms of assets and debts. The local representative that hospitals and long-term care facilities may be dealing with would be someone for care and treatment decisions and or someone for financial decisions. Those are two separate uh, entities. Uh, if the person has an estate of more than $10,000, the financial rep in talking with them, with you, will probably re defer that to the estates division. Unfortunately, the financial representative's role ends at death. So even if the decedent has, say, $5,000 in their account, the financial rep isn't able to contact a funeral home and arrange for disposition of the body. Uh, we would have to then still claim and issue a warrant for municipal burial while directing social services to uh, connect with the financial rep for uh, recouping some of the funds. I also want to make a distinction between a warrant to bury, which is issued uh, by a coroner for every um, body that we deal with, uh, so that when the family or claimant steps forward, they can continue with this position of the body without any pause. Then we have a report and warrant to dispose of an unclaimed body under the Anatomy Act. Uh, so it's really important that folks know the difference. Uh, I did have one small hospital uh, proceed to social services with a warrant to bury um, and got phone calls from all three places and then I realized that they thought the warrant to bury was a warrant for municipal burial. Um, and they had only had this body for one day. Uh, and the sister stepped forward. So it, would, it was a disaster that we averted um, as I figured out that these three colors were all from the same place and all talking about the same issue. The reason why we bury only, even though it is more expensive, is because it's always possible that a claimant or next of kin could step forward in years to come. So we'll have documented that we conducted a reasonable next of kin search, but we can't go back on cremation. Whereas as unpleasant as it might be emotionally and as costly as it might be, a uh, burial or buried body can be exhumed and moved if that's what the claimant would prefer. So we have a case study that we'll uh, use to work. We do. I should, have, I should have had you introduce it instead of getting up again. So that's a, that's a bit of a walk through the, the legislative and the directive piece of, of what we do when we have a body who looks to be unclaimed. What we're going to do now is walk you through what would actually happen if Al presented and died at our hospital. So this is a case that is a, is a congregation of lots that is familiar to us both at St. Mike's and at the coroner's office and probably to you guys in your organizations as well. So Al's a 50, so a 55 year old man presents to the ED and is admitted with sepsis and subsequently dies three days later. The social worker did meet with Al before he died, but Al didn't want to discuss funeral arrangements and denied having any next of kin. There were no visitors to the hospital that anybody could recall. His admission record, when we went back and looked at it, listed a friend as his emergency contact. And hospital staff knew, based on the above, that it was very likely that Al was going to be unclaimed. So what we're going to do now is Mike is going to come up 
and walk you through what our hospital action looks like using the form that we've standardized to set that reasonable bar for us. Okay. We got a claimant search worksheet that we're going to use from, I guess, from now step forward. Um, first thing we do here is look for the emergency contact that we have in the hospital records. We got a number there. As you can see, we try to call a couple of times, left the voicemail, finally got a response, will not claim the body. Next, we go to the next, we got the next name on the list, which is the landlord's contact, which was provided by Con Smythe at the start. Kathy Smith was the landlord. So she has no next of kin on file. However, she gave housing detail, worker details, and uh, actually searched the room for personal effects and uh, I found a number for Marge. At this point, Marge would be the next person on the list to call. So there's no description on who Marge is, it's just a name. We call Marge, number's not in service, pretty much almost at a dead end. At this point, 10 days later is when you would send an email to the Ontario Public Guardian and, Tru and Trustee, sorry. This is when they'll perform their estate search, see if, like Deidre was saying, if there's any money, anything that, like an investigation of sort. At that point in our list here, which actually is going pretty smooth, Hazel Williams calls. She's the housing worker that I left the message for earlier, apparently. And then at this point, she confirmed that the patient was in re receiving Ontario Works services and thought that a daughter had, was on file, but there was no details. So Jack Bauer is actually an Ontario Works worker that I call after that. No next, on, next, sorry, no next of kin on computer, but the file predates the system but there was a brother listed in 1997. At this point, the, un <coughs> so on this point, Fred Waters is the brother that was listed on the records. And uh, as you can see that uh, his number has been disconnected probably because his name was on the service a long time ago. Sorry, just, just double checking here. Sergeant Gunderson, this is the police that I call after this as almost like a last attempt. I have spoke with police before. Sometimes they help, sometimes they don't have much, but you can see in this example that he will not assist in what we have to do in the next of kin search. After around, I think it's around a one month after a OPGT investigation, that's when, I guess that's a possible, like a great amount of time for them to do their investigation for the next of kin or to see if they have enough estate to take care of the body. I would give them a follow-up email just to make sure everything is perfect, everything is um, like they, if they're going to take the body or not. If uh, that fails, my next step is to, I guess, put all the information I received from this log, as you could see from the start, and call the coroner's office, tell them what, what I found, any information or any next tips I could do. If, if nothing then, if everything is just, I guess, if there's no information on next akin, this is when I fax to the coroner approximately a month and change after that OBGT investigation. So, thanks, Mike. So, we've done this example here. Mike's selling himself a bit short. So, all of those phone calls on this example here for the purposes of this, people returned voicemails, people weren't on vacation, people hadn't left their job, and the timeline that we have across the top is our best case scenario. So we clock day one as the date the patient came into the morgue. On If there's been no contact for five days, that's when Mike starts his reasonable search, or in the case of Al, we had a pretty good sense that he was gonna go on claim, so we could have time, um, 
you know, time available, started that a bit before. On day 10, we have a prompt there to automatically, um, if our investigation looks to be going nowhere, contact the public guardian and trustee, and another note to chase that up 30 days later. And then again, in a perfect world, what this meant for Al was that the OPGT said they didn't have any um, any results from, from their search, police wouldn't speak to us, so we punted to the coroner's office and again, this perfect, so that happens on the 21st of December, and our Christmas present is that, that Daedra issues us a warrant and a funeral home comes and picks up Al. Um, what we've done at St. Mike's to standardize this form is we've, we've tried to make it easy for people to log their interactions with, um, with organizations so that that can in itself is the record that we send off to the coroner's office so they can look at it and go, hey, these guys did do a reasonable search. The suggested contacts at the bottom are just a prompt to us um, about who we could possibly look for. In the main, doing this job falls to Mike with his morgue attendant hat on, um, but we have lots of support from social workers and case managers and people on the unit who may have known the um, who may have known the patient and are able to help us trawl through through charts. And that's a piece of work organizationally we've been doing in the last six months is, is giving those members of staff a bit of training on on how to do this and a bit of background like you're having today on why it's important. Now it's over to Sean for the next one. So the hospital completed their investigation to the uh, best of their abilities and conducted their reasonable search. And uh, now it's our turn, the Office of the Chief Coroner's course of action. Um, so we collected all the information that Mike from St. Mike's, I love saying that, um, provided with us. And we contact the local police division and what came up is they performed their next of kin search and we found that there is an ex-wife with uh, three children who live in Toronto. Um, and then what we would do shortly after that is to inform the Ontario Public Guardian and Trustee that, to cancel their inquiry because as, as you've heard earlier, uh, once there's next of kin within Ontario, this would not apply for their investigation. So we would then contact the ex-wife of the decedent and ask them a few questions. And um, it's really important to ask the next of kin about next of kin. So once we've made contact with the ex-wife, ask them if, um, ask her if the, the three children would be interested in claiming. So what we found out is all three declined. However, one of the children would like to be informed on when the, the funeral services would occur. So some municipalities allow for a small service to occur when, when the body is buried and family and friends could attend. So that's very important to, to understand. And lastly, we would collect all the information that Mike provided to us and submit the documentation along with the warrant for burial to the regional supervising coroner for review. After he or she has completed the review, he will either approve or decline, and then we would go through this cycle. But in this case, he did approve the, um, the warrant for burial, and we would then inform St. Michael's Hospital that the in investigation has been completed, and we're gonna be faxing the warrant for burial to the uh, municipality social services. So we also included the information of the eldest son, so name and contact information, so that he could be made aware of when and where the funeral uh, would occur. And then after that, it's now in the hands of the social services. So they would then contact the funeral home and provide funds and the burial and plot location of where Al would be buried. After that, the funeral home would then pick up the body from the funeral home morgue or wherever, the, wherever Al is stored and a small service would, would commence with uh, Al's burial. Afterwards, the funeral home would advise our office that Al has been buried and would provide the uh, plot and site number and case closed. I'll just hand it over to Deidre. So I'm going to talk about some tips for success um, and first I will say that while memos about uh, 
facilities doing uh, reasonable next of kin searches went out earlier this year, they went out to CEOs and administrators. And that may mean that they did not trickle down to the actual staff person who gets assigned to conduct a reasonable next of kin search. Um, and I just want to put out there that the Office of the Chief Coroner, Sean and myself, are very open to helping folks work through this because it's very likely going to be new uh, for lots of people. We can provide our policy and guideline. Uh, you can uh, use that to develop a worksheet that you may use. I have a policy and procedure from certain hospitals that we can provide if a hospital is looking to uh, create its own and we have permission to share these things so that folks aren't reinventing the wheel. Um, so that may be an overall arching tip for success is to let us know as soon as you get this case uh, and we can help guide you and provide some direction in terms of working the case. We are clear though uh, that the case lives with you until it's finished. So we're not able to track a case. Um, for example, what I mean by that is a hospital social worker faxes us their next of kin search and we review it and it looks like this person's first language was Mandarin and they are relatively young. So I identify the uh, Republic of China consult. Okay. Help me out here. Consulate, Consulate thank you. <laughs> Consulate uh, for the person to call. Um, and that, in that situation, we would push that case back to the hospital. So it wouldn't be a matter of that social worker just faxing us a note regarding her work with the consulate. She would need to finish the case and then resubmit. Um, we just aren't able to create files and hold all of those files on a desk until we have a complete case. We will review, push it back, and then receive the complete case when it's done. Um, and this really is so that we don't uh, lose additional pieces of paper or have errors in missing folks completely. Uh, it does seem to be a driver that if there's a body in your morgue um, or if there's a file on your desk that it, it won't get lost. Um, because that, that acts as a driver for the work to be done. So tips for success, particularly with long-term care facilities and, and with hospitals where a patient may be uh, admitted for uh, some time, prioritize advanced care planning um, and have those difficult conversations with a decedent uh, to see who uh, would be their emergency contact and maybe even contact that person ahead of time. Sometimes it's someone in the building who says, I am their emergency contact. I live two doors down from them. Um, I saw them at Thanksgiving party. Um, or the person is actually a friend. Make note of visitors um, because those may be individuals who might claim. It doesn't actually have to be a next of kin who claims. Um, and document the wishes of the decedent. So if it, the decedent wants to be cremated, there are some exceptions and situations where we might be able to do that. Or we might be able to facilitate a friend claiming with social services because then the friend can dictate cremation um, much more easily than we can. Adopt a reasonable search form that works for your setting. Um, and that will really help with pushback because we are sometimes pushing back because documentation isn't clear. It might say that, you know, I called uh, the housing worker and left a message. Or I called these three people but didn't leave a message for confidentiality reasons. Well, so then I'm going to have to say, you know, I have to push this back and ask you to call them all again. Um, and leave, maybe leave a message this time and try to wrap up those threads. Um, before we are able to claim. Establish timelines that work for your setting. And by this, I mean different settings based on morgue capacity and, and, and numbers of bodies that they may have to deal with who might be unclaimed will have different processes by which they decide somebody's gonna be unclaimed and when they start to work on a case. So for example, in our morgue, uh, we have identified a 10 day time frame 
before we start working on a case as unclaimed. Um, and that's because we have a little more capacity, but also because we may be dealing with folks who are, uh, whose home is in another country who are needing to arrange for a visa to visit, uh, cremate the body and then go back home. We also don't have the ability to track phone calls. Um, Niagara Health System, for example, has set their criteria at 48 hours and it's based on a call. So if we don't receive a call from someone who's a claimant or next of kin within 48 hours for Niagara Regional Health System, then they will start working that case as unclaimed. Um, it's possible the shorter the time frame, the more likely there'll be work done uh, and the claimant may step forward. So work done could then be redundant, unless of course you're identifying a claimant in that process. But places have to do that um, related to uh, private storage and how much that is costing them versus the work of staff uh, and or their own morgue capacity. You'd want to have a plan if you are working for a facility that does not have its own morgue. Uh, some uh, long-term care facilities or hospices have a relationship with a funeral home who will collect the body and store it, uh, or there are private facilities in Ontario and a fee attached. A funeral home is likely to pick up the body and store it for a short period of time as they're motivated in terms of the business. Uh, sometimes we run into trouble where a funeral home picks up a body and no one claims the body, but they don't actually have cold storage. Uh, so they're re quite anxious to then deal with this. And then we are in a position where the funeral home is needing to work the case as the long-term care facility who should work the case are not really motivated because uh, they're not actually dealing with the body. And in these cases, we try to contact the long-term care facility pass on the policy and guidelines for going forward, as well as try to assist the funeral home uh, in, in their work. Also, put a post-it note or put a calendar note to follow up with OPGT in 30 days. Sometimes they will email you directly and say, inquiry is finished and this patient doesn't qualify. Oh, sorry, I keep calling the patient's decedent doesn't qualify. Sometimes you need to follow up and ask where they are at in the investigation before you'll get that information. And as I said, you can ask for help from us at any time, from the very beginning to the middle to the end of your search. Finally, areas that we haven't sussed out yet, um, personal belongings, for example. We don't have a stance on personal belongings, and that can be a real tricky place for uh, storage facilities or hospitals where, you know, this wallet contained $50, and what do we do with this? Um, and so that's one thing that we want to develop a position statement on, and I know Marissa has looking at that for St. Mike's. So whenever a hospital or facility comes up with a policy, please think about sharing it with us um, because we can then share it with other folks who are absolutely dealing with the same issues that you have been. Ethically, I'm not sure if it's ethically fair, and this could be something to be discussed with, say, bioethicists, if a person while they're alive is really clear that they don't want anyone in their family to know and or won't provide any next of kin information, after they're deceased, we then enter into a next of kin search. Uh, my experience is that next of kin, even if they've been estranged for 40 years, are usually um, in cases where there was big dysfunction, perhaps, and children who may not have had contact with that person, um, provides them with some closure. Other family members are irritated because they have to uh, do paperwork and things related to an estate. Um, and some folks uh, just don't wanna have anything to do with anything. Um, so if the decedent is, was already clear that that's what they wished, and we go and do a next of kin search, how ethical is that? And then in terms of social media searches, and Maureen, who is here, did a lot of work on unclaimed bodies at the Office of the Chief Coroner. 
uh, has actually found lots of next of kin with social media searches and our policy doesn't have that yet and I think that is a reasonable thing to do, a social media search, but at the same time, what's the expectation of privacy for a patient? Uh, if they're living, is it okay for staff to do a social media search on them? And if it's not, like, need you Google your patient? And if it's not, which I think it's not, um, is it ethical or okay to do that in terms of privacy after they've passed away? So these are some of the things that we don't have a position on yet, but things that have come up. Um, so this is still a work in progress across the province. So we've got time for questions. And Marissa says we have lots, but we're going to put that out to the live audience first. Does anyone have any questions related to a reasonable next of kin search, unclaimed bodies? So the question was, how has medical assistance in dying or death made affected the coroner's office? Um, I'll answer that. We have a medical assistance nurse. So every one of those deaths is investigated to ensure that it's the legislation that applies. So that uh, there have been two independent assessments that their uh, condition guidelines in terms of being irreversible and or that their death is impending um, and that the forms were signed appropriately. So for example, um, you, you cannot be a witness to uh, the declaration that one wants made if one stands to benefit from that person's death. So. If you are one of the adult children of the individual, um, you probably will inherit it, and that is the sign as a witness. All of those aspects of cases are. I don't think we've had any unclaimed bodies, though. Really, as a matter of Any other qu? Oh, wow, that is. <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> It's a closely guarded secret. <laughs> we're, we're not, um, we have a, spots for around around 18. And around 18. Eight, 18. One eight. Prepare to be very jealous. How many, do you want to tell them how many spots you guys have? We have between 200 to 250, but there's capacity to exhaust that number. Part of that for our building, which was made state of the art, uh, and we moved in there in 2014, is also about ensuring that we have capacity to accept bodies related to a mass disaster. Um, so we cannot have all of those places be full and also fulfill that role. How about we take a question from online folks? First question is, who is responsible for long-term care storage and creation of records created uh, that are resulting from the search of, for the next of kin? So the long-term care facility itself is responsible for the storage of the body of the person who dies in their facility. Um, and so I would absolutely encourage facilities to get ahead of this um, because you know that everyone in the facility is probably going to pass away in the facility at some point um, to then make arrangements um, before this happens than for who and where um, this body is going to be stored. In terms of files, I think that it's reasonable for the next of kin search to go in that patient's file uh, post-mortem. Uh, and when you are faxing your or emailing us your submission 
related to the next of kin search all of all of our unclaimed uh, cases uh, have we put into a file as well so if it's a coroner's case it has a file already and we'll put it in there if it's not a coroner's case it will be assigned a number uh, under our unclaimed and that's about again uh, documenting the work that we're doing um, documentation reflects a reasonable next of kin search we know from hospitals if it's not written down it didn't happen right um, and it's possible that we may have to look back on this i think we had a case come up maureen was it yours 10 years a case where a claimant stepped forward yeah, how, when how long was it was it your case sean okay yeah. sorry sean's case a family member who found out that their their loved one passed away and uh, suspected that it was an unclaimed uh, body case requested documentation and information on that case so it's just always important to have documentation for the for the reasonable search that's been completed for those cases so which plot um, this person is in so that that family member or claimant can go and visit the site of the burial. A question from the online group is, uh, what's the average cost to store a body uh, for, per day? Do you want me to speak to this? Yeah. yeah. So, so for an offsite storage company, um, one, you pay for the body to be transported to their offsite storage. So, depending on distance, you're probably looking at around $150 for the transportation of the body. And then, the, usually, it's done by it's a service provided by funeral homes, and they charge a daily rate that varies anywhere. It's probably different city to rural. Um, but you're looking at between thirty and fifty dollars a day. I think is probably fair to say. And we had a question up there. Do you mind, sorry, do you mind going to the microphone so the Zoom people can hear you? And thank you. I was just going to share that at Toronto General, we have a morgue record that we keep for up to five years. And I didn't know if that was an appropriate amount of time. That was one question. The other thing is we've worked as a standard of practice for social work to have a section within our morgue log so that it's, it's kept updated. And that the belongings, secure, the security department oversees the belongings and they're kept in, in uh, numbered lockers within the morgue. But just in terms of the record keeping. About that. Working with someone in records information management because I think most institutions are keeping records for, I think the, the minimum is 50 years, but most of them are keeping them indefinitely. Um, so it, it may be uh, something that you would want to bring forward to your records information management people. Our claimant record would go on the patient chart. And so it's store, it would be stored for as long as the patient chart was, which depends on whether it's a pediatric or an adult patient. I'm aware, I'm aware of the time. But Are there any more questions in the audience? Hi. Oh, sorry, can, you, can we ask you to use the microphone? Sorry. With the uh, unclaimed bodies at the coroner's office, the public guardian and trustee office can take quite a long time, so you just have to bear with them. I just got notification today that one of our long-term ones will be going out, and public guardian and trustee took that case on March 9th. So some cases are more difficult than others. You just have to sort of sit tight and touch base with them periodically to see where they are at in their investigation. Thank you, that's a helpful tip. Anything else from the audience? Was there anything else on Zoom? Lauren? Oh, what? There's lots of questions. But I'll ask one more. Sure. How long can a body stay uh, unclaimed in a 
uh, hospital morgue. Do you, do you want to answer? No, okay. Um, theoretically, it could stay there forever. Um, hence, no, that's not on that continuum we were looking at, that's not reasonable. Um, but <laughs> Monica, the director of risk, is shaking her head back there too. Because um, obviously, so theoretically, it could stay there forever. If you didn't work an unclaimed body, it could stay there forever. Um, and that's why it's important to determine as an organization whether you're going to subscribe to the Anatomy Act 48 hours or we have five days, some people have 10 days, and start that work. For a couple of reasons, the condition of a body, even in a morgue, would deteriorate to a point where it would be unhelpful um, for the organization and for anybody who had thoughts of maybe claiming or viewing a body. So that's something to always keep in mind. And the longer you, like, like anything, right, the longer we have some lost and found, the less likely we're likely to repatriate it, the, lo the, the longer, the harder it's going to be for people like Mike or the social worker to remember the details of that case. So. Our, our suggestion is that you start that process soon, and if you're really stuck or if you have questions, you reach out to the coroner's office to get support around that, um, because otherwise, if you don't show proof of doing that reasonable search, these guys can refuse to accept the body, so it does remain with the healthcare organization. Do you want to ask me more? Okay, so for those on Zoom, um, if you have questions, put your email in the chat and we'll make sure we get back to you guys um, right away. Look for, an evalu look for an evaluation coming. For those in person, thank you very much. And to all of those here that made the trip from their sunny offices north of, north of us, thank you very much and um, have a great rest of the day.